Hi, welcome, good evening, uh, welcome to another episode of Learn Live UAE. Uh, my name is Mark Anderson and uh, I'm your host for this evening. Now, uh, if you're a regular uh, viewer to Learn Live UAE, then you'll notice something's not quite right. Uh, things aren't as they normally are, and that's right. Uh, my co-host, uh, Ollie Liss, is unfortunately unwell. Uh, so um, he's uh, not joining uh, me for this evening's show. Uh, but please, please, please do uh, send him your well wishes. Um, you'll know he's O Lewis underscore coaching on Twitter. Um, forgive me too. I've been a bit under the weather recently uh, with the flu myself. So if I do need to break off uh, for a second, uh, please bear with me uh, trying to, to do the best we can. But it's important that we, we put the shows out each and every week. Um, this week, um, we're really excited to uh, be sharing a show uh, for you, which is going to focus on how to navigate teacher sharing and making it work for you. Now, some might say I'm a bit of a case study for that sort of thing myself, given that I uh, was formerly a teacher and a school leader and, and have, have moved into a world where I do things like this and uh, I still write on my blog, I write in magazines, all these kind of things. But it's a really tricky world out there, balancing um, contracts you might have with your school. Uh, thinking about issues around copyright, uh, all sorts of things like that. And so I'm really, really pleased to um, be able to welcome to the show this evening two uh, UAE-based educators. Uh, we've got Sabe uh, um, joining us, uh, and although uh, Thomas's uh, uh, profile's up first. I'll talk about Thomas first. Thomas Blakemore uh, calls himself a 21st century educator. He's a YouTuber. Um, you know, I, I like to think I've got a few subscribers on my YouTube channel, but um, honestly, Thomas will blow your socks off with the uh, sort of interaction and engagement he gets with his YouTube channel. So I'm really excited to hear his perspectives on teacher sharing. Uh, he's a primary school uh, teacher, and you can follow him on Twitter uh, at Thomas Blakemore. When you go there, um, you'll see in his profile as a link through to his um, uh, educator focused YouTube channel. Uh, so you can uh, go and have a look at that and see all the great content that he's out there sharing. And we've also got Sabe joining us. Um, he's an Apple Distinguished Educator like myself. He's an author as well. He's been talking about how he shares his books and these sorts of things as well. And he's also a primary teacher in the uh, UAE as well. Uh, so that's uh, the show this evening. Uh, it would be remiss of me, though, to not remind you about the Learn Live UAE conference that we got taking place uh, a week Friday, uh, October 16th. Uh, please do um, uh, get involved and find out more. If you want to find out more about the event, uh, then please do visit uh, learnliveuae.com. Uh, all the information is on there. And Ollie and I hope to be having a special little show later this week uh, where we're going to launch our um, agenda, uh, sort of sharing with you who all of our various speakers are for the event. Really, really excited for uh, the conference, uh, something we've been working really, really hard on, as you can see. Um, it's uh, being sponsored by a few people, and I'm really pleased uh, to have the event sponsored by Classroom.Cloud, uh, who are our platinum sponsors for the event, and uh, who are also sponsoring this episode as well of Learn Live UAE. Also, a big thanks to Guess and to Teach Middle East magazine, who are sponsoring the event. And a big shout out as well to uh, National Online Safety, who are providing our three prizes for the event, uh, which is three $100 Amazon vouchers to be won uh, during the live event as well. So please do go to learnliveue.com to find out more. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, enough of me talking on about the, all these things to do with the conference. We're here today to learn uh, a bit about uh, teacher sharing and how to make it work for you. So and with that in mind, I'm just going to remove that away. And I'm going to bring in my first guest, and it's going to be Sabe. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, good, thanks. You, um, how are you going, Mark? Yeah, I'm really, really good, thank you. Uh, I just want to do a shout-out to uh, a guest from last week's show. Actually, not, uh, Neil Statham was on the show last week, so looking forward to another episode. Get well soon, both. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, I've got some Vicks uh, uh, Vapor Rub on. I've got some Alba Soil uh, on, on my shirt helping me breathe and things. Um, really looking forward to uh, both of us getting well soon. But uh, tell us, Sabi, um, how are things with you? We, we had a chat before the show. Um, we found out that you, your 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 child and and your wife have had um, COVID this this yes. year. Yes. Oh, look, it was a um, traumatic experience. But um, it was back in May. Um, we didn't realise that she'd actually got it from our nanny, um, who actually turned up to work unwell, and um, 
the next day we both kind of went down um, and I kind of bounced back that afternoon, but my wife ended up spiking the temperature um, because she, you know, she was, you know, it was only five months after she'd given birth. So her immune system wasn't all up to where it normally is. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, she was just in and out um, for about a month or so. Um, You know, that was just when we'd gone into lockdown here in the UAE. Um, So we were at home um, trying to do e-learning and I had this five month old. So I actually had to go into um, take time off work to actually look after her. Um, who was actually positive, um, believe it or not. My daughter was asymptomatic the whole time, but um, somehow didn't manage to contract it myself. So, you know, and this is your five-month-old. I mean, if you, you've got children, you know, there's all sorts of bodily fluids flying at you in all different angles, yeah. but um, um, managed to dodge all that. But um, we've bounced back and we're all in a much better space now. But, um, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, having actually gone through it all and come out the other end. So it's been an interesting, interesting ride. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely, and and very scary too because there's so. Yeah, it was. Um, there was a lot of unknowns um, for us at that time. I don't actually know. You know, we, we didn't know a lot about it. Um, we were we were sort of um, you know reading up live as to what was going on or, and all this new information. We're trying to make sense of it all at the same time. So, yeah, really scary, but. Um, we had some great doctors who talked us through it all and really held our hands through the whole process and we're forever always connected. I cannot fault um, the system here at all. Um, we were very much looked after and very much um, in good hands. Oh, that's, that's superb to hear. Thank you so much. Look, um, obviously, I, I, I've, I've known of you for some time. We met at the um, at the Jess Summit back in February uh, when uh, things weren't as they are quite right now. Oh, Yeah. Uh, but but um, for, for viewers who don't know you, could you just share um, to our audience a little bit about who you are um, and uh, sort of where you come from and, and your experiences in, in education, your work, that sort of thing? Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, everyone, I, my name is Sabi. My full name is actually Sebastian Nyanam. It's Sri Lankan origin. I think it's um, like the Tamil version of Sebastian. But over time, my friends have kind of dubbed me as Sabi, so it's just kind of stuck for the past 33 years. Um, originally, i um, born and raised in New Zealand, actually, a Kiwi educator. Um, I did my training out there, did my um, first two years. I went back to my old primary school where it all began and um, did all my um, training there and then um, kind of got bored with where I was and jumped ship to Australia, to Melbourne, where I was hoping to only do a six-month stint before I came out to the UAE. But, you know, life sort of happened um, and, uh, you know, uh, fell in love, met, met my wife, got a house, everything, um, and we were stuck. Um, we were not stuck, I guess we were there. We started our lives there for about six, five, five to six years. And then we um, got married and then we jumped ship to the UAE in 2018. I am, I've been in primary education the whole time. Um, I kind of very quickly got typecast as the, you know, the senior school male teacher. So my experience is um, predominantly from grade four all the way to grade six is where I've just sort of floated back and forth. Um, and very much, very much, very passionate about, um, you know, um, the power of iPad and technology in the classroom. So that kind of happened very quickly in my first, I think my second year of teaching when I um, bought my own iPad, it was the only iPad that I had with my classroom um, of 24 children. And so you could see, you know, all these kids huddling around um, trying to use the screen. And we only had the one, um, you know, we were in a low socioeconomic area, so we didn't have a lot of funds to play with state school. Um, and you know what? I've, through the through the uh, years, I've kind of jumped ship to different schools, had a bit of experience in state um, education, and this, I guess, the stint here in the UAE is my first stint um, with international um, private schools. Um, so yeah, that's more or less me, really. Um, I'm currently working at Victoria International School in Sharjah. Usually, when you tell people that you're in the UAE, they assume you're in Dubai. They think the UAE and the Dubai and Dubai are almost hand in hand. They're the same. We're actually the Northern Emirate, so just above um, Dubai, so mm. stone's throw away from um, Dubai Airport. Actually, uh, been there for a couple of years, and I'm rolling into my third year now. Brilliant stuff. It's lovely to hear your story there. It's really interesting that sort of the journey you've taken from where you were with having just one iPad in the classroom to where you are now. Um, so yeah. like me, you're an Apple Distinguished Educator. And um, one of the things that you've been involved with, uh, Sabe, is about creating your own book and sharing it to Apple Books. Could you describe how that came about and the process by which you completed it and some of the sort of impacts you've seen from creating that book and then sharing it out there? 
Yeah, look, um, when I um, did the whole ADE, went through the ADE process, so I made my video and, you know, all the while I, um, you know, downloaded people's books like um, Matt Pullen and Simon, um, uh, oh, their books, are, yeah, for Simon Pyle, sorry, their books are the ones that I have, um, you know, followed actively and then, you know, went to the Institute and I actually met um, Matt Pullen in the, in the flesh and I was sort of, you know, having a bit of a fanboy moment um, and Simon was supposed to be there and he, he was unwell at the time. And that kind of uh, that kind of sort of inspired me to kind of go, oh, you know what? It's, you know, there's a, I've I've got a bit of a story to share. And my only thing that I remember uh, before I set out to do was I remembered, um, you know, going to PDs and people pushing um, resources onto me. And I'd always they were either very you know wordy um, or you know not as user friendly. And I thought I I, I want to put together something where everything that a teacher could possibly need, including you know resource material, the how, the why, examples, all, you know, the worked examples, everything that you need to be able to just pick it up and run with it. I want, I want to create something like that. And so um, the, the, my first book, what's I think the series that I've gone with is what's happening in the classroom. And so the first one was what's happening with Keynote and was using Keynote to prototype apps. Um, that one, I, um, I'd been, I'd, you know, I'd done a couple of projects back in Australia and here in the UAE. And I sort of thought, um, you know, to me, it was just the norm, but every teacher I shared it to, they're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. How'd you even come up with it? And I, and I honestly just had to play around with it. And I went to, I think it was one Apple um, session and the guy was like, oh, you know, you can link things internally with your, um, you know, with your keynote slides. And I thought, this is kind of cool. You can create some buttons and all sorts. So I kind of just went about, uh, you know, um, putting together where, you know, how I would start. And then slowly, the more I thought about it, I thought, no, I need to think about animations. I need to think about, you know, the layout of the book and how that's going to look like and what content I'm going to put in there. Mm. And, you know, before I, um, this was before my daughter arrived. <laughs> so this was back in, I think it was um, November, uh, maybe October-ish, I think. I dropped my wife off to, um, to get her day spa before baby arrived. And I went and checked myself into a cafe and I just sat there the whole day just plugging away and by the end of the day I'd kind of put together this whole book and I just wanted to proofread it and put it out there and I didn't think anybody was going to actually care to be honest I just thought oh you know someone will you know I might get a couple of hundred downloads whatever it was and um and then I got an email from I think it was Casey not too long afterwards um she's another ADE and um you know going on about you know we want to feature your book and this and that I thought oh wow people are actually downloading this and then um, oh, silly me, I didn't actually check the iTunes Connect account to see how many downloads I'd actually um, got over the time. So I think it was about maybe January when I logged in and I thought, where on earth did these two and a half thousand downloads come from? And when I looked into there, it, I didn't realize there was so many people from all over the world had actually downloaded it. Um, which then made sense because I was getting questions through Twitter around, you know, or, you know, people wanting to share and people started tagging me and then it kind of just grew and grew and grew. And I just checked it this morning and it's like three and a half thousand downloads. Um, so it must have struck a nerve with people and it was hopefully really useful. I'm fine. I'm hoping. And um, the more people have tagged and shared their ideas and the more I've sort of thought, oh, that's an interesting way of doing things. So it's nice to be able to see how people have taken one idea and run with it and put their own spin on it. And I think that's what sort of motivated me to come up with the second one, um, which only came out about a month or two ago, uh, which is what's happening with Mimoji and Animoji in the classroom. So um, it was a long, I guess, a long process, but the more I thought about it, it actually wasn't as long. I just looked at what was already out there through Matt and Simon's books and kind of thought, how am I going to adapt my story to it? And then piece it all together. And then it just kind of happened. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, how did you go about, um, actually, have you got the book handy to share with us on the screen so we can have a little look at it? Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, do. Yeah, do. Uh, give me two seconds. Let's uh, share screen. Here we go. You can see the um, app there or the, the book there. There we go. So um, this is the... Um, yeah, this is the recent one, uh, the What's Happening with Memoji and Animoji. Um, so I just really went through, and I'll just skip ahead to the, um, the fun stuff. Um, you know, people used to, uh, I had teachers say to me, oh, you know, Animoji, Memoji, they're just gimmicks. You know, what are the kids going to actually do with it? And I sort of, I sort of set out, this was a mission to set out to dismiss some, um, you know, naysayers around how you can't use it in the classroom. So I went and I made it my mission last year to think about how you can actually go about um, using Memoji in the classroom. So I'm showing people how to, um, 
you know, I save it to your um, camera roll and then I go through, you can create instructional videos. There's 10 ideas in here. I won't, I'll just um, fly through them really quickly if that's okay. Um, you know, how to do video clips and clips. Um, you know, how you can use them as avatars for online safety. Um, you can get the kids to practice their speech with it. They love this because they can actually track how many times their Memoji looks down or, um, you know, turns around and they can actually work on their um, facial um, gestures. You can, how you can create animations. So there's example, worked examples there as well. Um, character development for narratives using the steel method. So I've got some worked examples here. Um, teaching dialogue when you're using like iMessages, so you can actually teach the kids that every time someone talks, it's on a new line. Um, mm -hmm. You can just transfer that into your writing. Um, using those visual feedback, feedback cues, this has been handy during the pandemic time. So I've just come up with a whole lot of um, different, um, sorry, um, you know, um, I guess sayings that we use in the classroom that we can use, you know, give me some feedback about the classroom or how are you feeling? So the kids have been able to just quickly project this uh, for me. So that's been really handy. Um, and display tags, if you want to um, get creative, um, in the, you know, at the start of the year and mm -hmm. uh, creating, a, creating a, a, a class guess who game as well. So mm -hmm. these are just 10 ideas that I thought that you can actually run with in the classroom. They're really easy to use. And um, it was really about um, getting teachers to look at it from another another angle that it wasn't just a sticker that you sent in iMessages. You can extract it out and you can app smash through a whole range of apps and come up with something uh, a bit more um, creative with the kids. Now that's, that's awesome. It's really, really, really lovely. and. Um, I say, the, the, uh, how, how technical do you think somebody has to actually be to sort of start producing these sorts of things, uh, Sabe? Like the books? Yeah. Yeah, honestly, uh, nothing at all. If you can make your way around pages and you can use a template, my very first book, I just grabbed out one of the um, te um, templates that were on pages and I just went with that. And um, the more I sort of played around with it, the more I actually wanted to change it up a little bit. And, you, you know, with the little, you, you'll see if, you, if you've downloaded and looked at both of them, they have, a, I've gone for a similar look with the little boxes everywhere. That was just me personalizing yeah. it. But honestly, you know, a, a 10 year old in your classroom can, can run with it. If you've got an idea, I think Pages gives you everything that you need to be able to just step it through. And what I liked about it was I could actually just go about it as I thought through and I could add pages, I can change things. And my whole creative thinking process was that I could, you know, I could map it out really easily. So um, very, very easy. Um, I highly support anyone to do it. And I'm happy if anybody wants a hand, you can reach out and I'm happy to I'm step you through it too. It is very, very simple. Very, very simple. No, I, I completely agree. It's, it's been lovely seeing the sort of migration from things that we're, we're an iBooks author back along uh, to how you can now do things in things like such as pages. It's so much easier and, and um, will it be so much easier? Uh, it does mean that it's, it makes it more accessible to people, doesn't it? For them to be able to actually uh, get on board and do those things. Um, yeah. Al Kingsley, um, Sabe, has just um, uh, done a little message to us both. He said he absolutely loves what you're doing here. Uh, can you share a link to the guide? Um, so where where can people find this? Um, where, where can people um, find these books to download? They're on um, Apple Books. If you just search up What's Happening, uh, they'll come up with both um, the series. They're the only What's Happening series that are on the Apple Bookstore so far. Um, there's another four in the making. I'm, I'll get there in between nappy changes. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the two of them are there. So if you search up What's Happening, um, A-P-P hyphen E-N-I-N-G, um, they should hopefully come up um, for you in the window there. Uh, that's brilliant stuff thank you very much indeed for sharing that book with us i'll just remove that right. out from the uh, cool. live stream and bring us all back uh, where we need to be um just a follow-up question on, on that front then so how mm -hmm. once you've actually gone through and you've made it all in pages and all that sort of thing how easy is it then to uh, for someone to share a publication in the way that you have done and have you got any advice that you would give to anybody um thinking of trying to do this themselves yes for sure um Number one, um, be, become friends with pixabay.com uh, for copyright free images if you need any examples and things like that. Um, I, um, if you are going to provide examples, it's best 
um, from my experience, if you can throw on some student examples in there as well. I used them as, um, I sort of, it was nice to sort of involve the kids in the process and it was a nice carrot for them to work towards as well. Cause I said to the kids, I'm working towards a book. I really want some worked examples and all 24 of them, um, you know, were really, really keen to get on board and they helped sort of decide which one they thought was best suited. So, you know, I didn't, um, I don't want to just create it for teachers without the students input. So this, the examples that you find in my book have actually been selected by both my classes and the UAE. Um, mm. That's the other thing. I think if you can bring your classroom on board, make it meaningful, uh, you know, sort of the challenge based learning sort of um, vision, bring it to life. Um, Pixabay um, involve the kids. And in terms of proofreading, really, really, really go over it with a fine tooth comb because I think I'm up to like version five for like silly typos. Um, so if you can go through that and, you know, get it all done, I think there's a bit of ownership on you with Apple Books um, that you're going to, you know, run it through all the filters and bits and pieces. So the best filter I have is my wife who works in marketing who goes through everything for me. So I thank her. She's my um, real life Grammarly. Um, and then once you're done, it's as, it's as easy as, I think you click uh, from memory, I think you click file, um, uh, is it share to Apple Books or start or maybe export to Apple Books, I think, don't quote me on that. Um, and it just, and it straight away connects to your um, was iTunes Connect account and it just steps through, I think there's four windows, boom, you're done. I think someone on the other end reviews it and within two, three days it goes live. Easy, very, very easy. And you can do that straight from your iPad and you can do it straight from um, your, your Mac as well. Very easy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You mentioned iTunes Connect. Is that something, yeah. uh, he says knowing the answer, but uh, is, is that something that you have to do separate? If you've got a standard Apple ID, how do yep. you, what, 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 what's this about iTunes Connect? What do you have to do there in order to make it all sort of work and, and sing together? Yeah, you do have to. Um, I kept the same IDs, and um, I did go and sign up to an iTunes Connect account. Um, I think that's the back-end sort of author account, so that you've got everything set up for you. Um, so when you go into it, you can actually track your books, you can track your sales, you can do, um, you know, like stats around numbers and things like that. So all of that's available through iTunes Connect. Uh, you just, if you've got an Apple ID, you're like one step closer than everyone else. It's just a matter of sort of like enabling it from the back end, um, so that you have got it all there. Don't do what I did and sign up multiple times. You'll end up with multiple accounts with different numbers under the same email address <laughs> and you'll have to deal with Apple to try and merge them all together. So just be patient. And um, when you've connected them all, um, it will be there. And it just gives you, um, you know, just that back end stats around how, you, how your book's actually going, uh, which makes it really easy. And it, and it actually ends up becoming a bit of a, a bit of an addiction now that I realize, oh, you know, who is downloading it and where have they shared it from, you, know, you can actually get some live um, useful information because a lot of the downloads at one point came from Italy and I don't realize that they were doing this huge push with um, coding and app prototyping and things like that. So their education department must have got wind of the um, app, um, so the, 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 the book, and it must yeah. have been something that they pushed out to the state. Uh, and so I had a, a quite a few thousand downloads come from uh, um, the, uh, from Italy themselves. Now, that's fantastic. And it's really empowering for your learners as well. I mean, I've run a few projects over the years where I've worked with students to produce their own content to put a book, which then goes on to uh, mm. the, the uh, Apple Books app. And the authenticity behind that is just amazing. They're so, they're, they're so enthused to you know, be writing a book that's going to be published that uh, anyone can download. But what's equally as helpful and, and great for them then is, is then seeing how many people have downloaded it and seeing where in the world they've come from and all those yeah. things as well. It's really um, yeah, really um, authentic uh, for, our, for, for learners to see that, that sort of activity going on. I've got a little tip for you, Sabe. Well, on on yes. the uh, on the proofreading front, I'm a, I'm I'm a, I'm, I've, I'm I, 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 I make typos all the time, um, and it's really difficult, particularly when you're the person who's written it to actually see the wood for the trees sometimes. Yes. Um, try highlighting the text on your iPad if you've gone to your settings and, yep. and turn the uh, speak selection option on in accessibility. Highlight yeah. your text and then just have Siri read your writing back to you. You'll hear far more easily the mistakes you've made because of the pronunciations that will be different because of uh, oh, yeah. the, so do, just listen back to it in the background. I'll often sort of, you know, do, I'll be doing some cooking or something and just get uh, Siri to read something back to me that I've written. And I'm like, oh, and, and, I, and, I, and, I make it, and, and it helps me fix all those errors, particularly when you know, you're stuck in a coffee shop or whatever it is working elsewhere or having got somebody uh, uh, like your lovely wife to go through with a fine tooth comb and, 
and find all those things. So I found that a really useful uh, uh, thing before. And actually, and that's a tip which is um, linked to something that Neil uh, Statton mentioned actually last week. One of his um, one of our questions at the end of every show is about uh, ed tech tools that can uh, help us. And he mentioned um, immersive reader uh, last week as oh, a tool yeah. that a similar sort of thing. Um, so it's a fantastic tool there. Um, just jumping into um, for, for this segment now, just uh, uh, my final sort of question for you. Um, how do you, how have you sort of ensured that you stay current um, in our ever changing profession? You seem like you've got your finger right on the pulse. You know, you, you're using me, uh, emojis and animojis and and all these different things. But how how do you stay on top of everything when when everything so, changes so quickly? I've been asked this a couple of times. My boss asks me all the time, so how do you know, you know, where to look and what to look for? I think it's just the real nerd in me. Like I get I'm that person that gets really excited by the next iOS, you know, update, a rollout. And I and I sit there and try and work out all the features and I go, okay. And straight away I think the teacher in me goes straight to how can I transfer this into the classroom? You know, even before I read up on something else. And I think that's one part of it. The other part of it really is um, the Twitter world. I think uh, has kept me on my toes. Like I just, I feel like even if I scroll through for like two minutes, I pick up something, you know, just a bite size something that I can go, ah, oh, that's interesting or that's different um, that I can try. Because my my main thing um, with keep, keeping current, I guess, is always just wanting to know how else can I do something different? How else can I make it an experience? Um, you know, because I always feel like our kids um, these days, you know, because they're so highly stimulated, um, you know, outside of, you know, the classroom, it's that, mm. I feel it's that much harder to entertain them. And, you know, and unless, unless you're using things that are, you know, that they are familiar with or you're giving them another way to look at it, you're almost like, you know, yesterday's news for them so i think that's sort of my driving force behind it is i'm always going okay you know what their attention span smaller i need to be able to throw them something at a different angle how am i going to do this um so i always think about okay what are they playing with what are they working with and sometimes i actually just talk to the kids hey you know what are you what are you guys into what works what's not what are you playing around with and sort of information gather a little bit so a bit of the kids a bit of my nerd you know, the nerd and me exploring, but then that, just that constant drive to go, how can I do this differently? No, and, and a lot of teachers I work with and I see sort of sharing on Twitter as well, you know, a lot of them will say, actually, I've been inspired to do this by a conversation with one of my students. It's often yeah. things, and, and, and as, as, as educators, we're always trying to do the best by the children we work with and wanted, like I said, to make things engaging and relevant and, and all these different sorts of things. Just going to do a shout out to uh, Mark Ryan, who's been messaging during the live show. He's asking if Ollie's off now, busy making his Bitmoji. Uh, you might have missed Mark. Uh, Ollie's poorly, so he's not with us this evening. Um, he's, he's gone on to say, though, that listening, Siri, listening to Siri truly is uh, 2020. Uh, it has been a strange, a strange world. I noticed that um, V Looker which is a, uh, an Excel function trending on Twitter today. You know, all the oh, things wow. to be trending on Twitter, V lookup. Uh, um, um, it, it, Mark does ask, though, if you've got a TikTok uh, account, have you, have you used TikTok with your students at all? See, I explored it. I'm so not vocally gifted whatsoever, so I'm not even going to try and sing. Um, I've got a dance background, but I haven't explored it. I downloaded it. I had to play with it, um, and I wasn't overly convinced. I think that, I think at the time there was some security issues that were sort of being talked about online, and um, you know, I had some parents really, really concerned. And I kind of, in my head, I kind of thought, "Oh, there's a, there's too many grey areas. There's too many red flags at that time." Um, so I kind of just parked that to the side for the moment, um, and I kept it safe. I kept it safe within the realms of what I was allowed to download um, on the on the school iPad and kept it that way. But, you know, I do make references to TikTok every now and then. I say to them, you know, if you're going to present something, so, for example, if it's going to be on your YouTube channel or on TikTok, you know, how would you stand up? What would you wear? Well, you know, how are you going to present things? So, you know, make those references and, you know, straight away you've made a bit of a connection there because that's an authentic audience that they are familiar with. No, absolutely. And that goes to some of the things like the Sarah Lambert and Danielle Duffy were sharing about in an episode recently. We were looking at Oracy, you know, sharing those constructs that are really helpful for how you present yourself and the, and the sort of the facial language and your body language mm. and 
all these different things as part of your com uh, your conversation is so important when you're, you're you're sort of trying to put yourself out there live in these sorts of ways. So, listen, thank you so much for your insights there. Um, I'm gonna um, not I'm not gonna kick you out. Uh, um, we're gonna bring in our <laughs> next guest now, which is uh, Thomas Blakemore. Uh, but um, please do feel free to chip in if you've got anything you want to add to the questions, and I will come back to you and ask things there as well. But uh, let's yes, uh, sure. bring uh, Thomas in now, and uh, here he is. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. I don't think Sabe got the uh, message about coordinating shirts this evening. Yeah, I thought I think it's we're going to get changed now. I've got a chicken blue shirt. I almost want to go get changed, but you know, yeah, we're live now. So. Team checks is the way forward. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, dear. I, I, I obviously I, I, I just uh, digress there with the shirt comment. And you're very welcome to the show, Thomas. Could you share for our audience uh, a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you work, um, you know that sort of thing, and um, we'll dig into some questions just after that. Of course, no worries. Yes, so Thomas Blakemore, the same as Twitter handle, name, and YouTube channel. I started my teaching career in the UK where I taught year five, six initially during my NQT year, moving through into year six. During that time teaching in the UK, I sort of wondered what it would be like to teach abroad. So then made the journey to teach over in Dubai at Kent College where I started in year three, progressing through, sorry, started in year two, progressing through to year three and enjoy it there too. So that's my teacher journey as per se. Um, in terms of YouTube, YouTube started when I was teaching in the UK with my year six class, and it was more of a passion project than anything else. Um, I could give you the reason, lots of different reasons as to why I started YouTube. However, passion was, was kind of one of the main things and trying to just sort of gain a new, new hobby. And so I didn't really have a clue how to do anything along those lines, so I just sort of went for it didn't know how to, to shoot videos or didn't know how to video edit or anything along those lines. So just thought I'd, I'd try and take up a new hobby as a way of sort of counteracting the high teacher workload in the UK, which sort of doesn't make sense at the same time um, by taking on a new hobby, but uh, just sort of went for it. And that's, that's YouTube as well. So in Dubai as a teacher at the moment, I'm humanities coordinator. And then when it comes to YouTube, I try and integrate some of my, passion for the world if you like into the, the youtube too so a little bit of travel but mainly teaching and educational type content nowadays too uh, brilliant so i'm just on your on your youtube channel now um it's, it's fair to say you've got a fair few subscribers there um how, yeah. how is that going, I think? um to be completely honest with you this year this year has just since lockdown uh, things have just grown exponentially, whether it's all the people stuck inside and wondering what to watch and then ended up with my weird face on the screen, you know. Um, since lockdown, I've really focused on ed tech and trying to provide content that focuses on, I know you'll be able to see Bitmoji there mainly. Uh, that became a, a very key niche, and a key trend, but also looking at other things like distance learning, home learning tips, and 80% of my audience is now American because I know they're continuing with online learning so they've got a, a large audience base there and that, i think that's mainly how it's grown sort of the, the ed tech side of things so i've really enjoyed sharing different ideas and it doesn't have to be something overly innovative it can just be compiling a list of things and bringing things together and sort of sharing my own thoughts and feelings because here in the uae we're ahead when it comes to online learning when we compare ourselves to countries like america then when i've created that content countries like America, sort of, I say, countries like the, the audience there from America, then look at what we've experienced and view it from their lens too. Yeah, no, no absolutely. Uh, I, I've always found myself, Thomas, that the work I've done has actually been great CPD for myself. I mean, I think Sabe will probably reinforce this, uh, this assertion. You know, when I went to the Apple, um, uh, the mm. Educational Institute, you know, it was it was the best CPD I could get because at the time, I, 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 it was just me. I, I was the person being asked to deliver the CPD, for example. Uh, so with that in mind, and you sharing these, these are amazingly high quality videos. I've gone through and watched uh, a whole bunch of them, um, and I've got to say, mm -hmm. I, I respect to your skills in terms of your various pieces of video editing and your overlays and how you go about doing it all and all the rest of it. So you know, hat tip and kudos Thank to you for, for the work you do. 
do there, Thomas. Linked to that, though, um, <laughs> how, is, how is doing that, do you think, helped to improve you as an educator? Because some, some schools, you know, I, I work with lots of schools, some schools wouldn't really be very pleased about a member of their staff going out there and doing this sort of work. And so how has, how has, how has this um, sort of helped you develop as an educator yourself? And how have you balanced your being able to do this sort of stuff alongside uh, what you do in your school as well? Is your school supportive of you doing this? They are, yes. They're, they're very supportive of me doing this and uh they like to share uh things that I, I get up to i try and not share my own videos with staff because i'm very aware that it could become a, a little bit too much like look, look at my videos um so i don't i don't share them too much with staff however it, it is recognized amongst staff too uh so in terms of how it sort of developed me as, a, as an educator it's made me think ahead if that makes sense so i've needed to really research and look at different tools that can be used. And for me to share a video, let's say I'm sharing a video about how to use, uh, uh, what was the, my, the, the reader software, Immersive Reader. Immersive Reader, yeah. Immersive Reader, so I can't make a video about how to use Immersive Reader if I've not used the software, because one, I don't believe that's authentic. So for me, I then need to look at all the ins and outs of how to utilize that software, and then I can sort of talk about, right, this is a fantastic piece of software and this is how you can share it then it's up to whether it's, it's myself or my my team to look at those those ideas in school and whether they can be used bitmoji classrooms uh, was something that became really supportive for my class during online distance learning and it was just something because i teach year three sometimes uh, google classroom can be quite text heavy so looking into how to create that and then sort of innovating my own little style on it to create the YouTube video, then really helped my own teaching. So I was sort of doing that research that then informed the teaching at the same time. Wellbeing, that's another question. Um, that's the struggle, to be completely honest with you. I almost sometimes work two shifts and I'm trying to now around this month, to be completely honest with you, coming back to school, really focus on the balance. I, have during lockdown, was able to create two, three, sometimes four videos a week. Now I'm realizing, you know, one video is more realistic because it's a, it's a bit crazy at the moment, isn't it? But I suppose well-being is one of my focuses. So, yeah, one video. That, that was going to be my question to you. I was going to look at you and go, mate, how on earth are you punching out these videos? Because uh, balancing both worlds. Yeah. Um, it was what I was really curious about. And I, and in my head, because I've just ventured into it, um, into YouTube, I thought, okay, yeah, let's try and do two. And, I, and once I started, you know, the editing process and everything else, I thought, actually, you know what? One's probably more realistic. Yeah, I've, gone with like a, I've gone with a one with one a fortnight, uh, not one a week. <laughs> absolutely. Well, so I've not got kids, to be honest with you, so that's one thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that changes things. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And, yeah, it's... There's a range of different things that I've got in place. Um, one of the things is having a set routine for a day where I edit. It's always been a Sunday. Sunday is Sunday is edit and upload day. So then it's film on a Friday. Uh, Sunday is edit and upload day. So I've got that routine for one video. And then if I can squeeze another video in, uh, then I, I try and do that basically. So that's the routine. And having things available like templates. So if I've got my text to try and upload on YouTube. I'll have that all saved in my notes. I've got my tags for the video saved in notes. I've got all my, because I use Final Cut to edit just because it's a little bit quicker uh, because I've got everything saved from previous videos. So all the little pop-ups, you know, teach travel triumph and all that business, that's yeah. something I can just copy, paste. Uh, my outro, my little intros and pop-up, that's all, all templates mm -hmm. basically, just to try and make everything as smooth as possible. I know when I first started it back in the UK, I was editing on uh, an old school Microsoft PC and my videos would take 14, 15 hours. And it was, it, I was like, mm, I can do one a week, but it was intense, very intense. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, those are some of the strategies. Uh, that's a lot of work, and it's, it's it's really interesting. You talk about well-being and mindfulness in, in terms of like the, the pressure you put yourself under. It can be it, when you start seeing. I mean, this is an experience that I've had, and and uh, obviously both of you have had as well. But it's it's quite um, uh, intoxicating, for want of better words, um, to to uh, be 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 popular and have lots of you know likes and views and downloads and 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 all these sorts of things. And and you, 
Yeah. I mean, have you been? You, you talk about that. You, know, you wanted to try and do four. You were able to do four and eight down to one. Do you feel compelled to, to actually like do these things regularly, Thomas? Do you feel like a, a, a compulsion to do them? Um, how would you feel, for example, if if you had to not put a video out for a month? How would that sort of sit sit with you? Because yeah. As I've had experience, you know, life life gets in the way sometimes. I've got two children. My uh, productivity when I had my children went from hero to almost Absolutely. zero, you know, overnight. And and I, I was already putting out nearly the ICT evangelist stuff and and what have you. And it, it becomes really difficult to to maintain that. But but you, you feel like you should be still yeah. maintaining the output all the time. Um, it's great to hear um, you you sharing advice about using things like you know regularly saved stings and pop ups and. Uh, and and um, little things that you use regularly, but yeah, how 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 do you feel about that that sort of compulsion thing? I I, I realise I've gone off off peak here a bit with the questions, Thomas. But how how do you feel no, about that? I, it's that's a generally when the that's what I'm figuring out. To be completely honest with you, I'm not not perfect. I've since lockdown and now I've got more of a commute and all those different things. I'm trying to figure out what the ideal scenario is for videos. I do feel the pressure to upload consistently because I've done it for a year and a half two years now but i suppose that's my own pressure rather than people saying that you know where's where's the videos it's my it's my own pressure that i've built upon myself and yeah. it's that's that's one of the challenges that i'm having at the moment is how am i going to transition into sharing more regularly but not overburdening myself at the same time mm. so this week for example uh monday would usually be an upload day I've sort of pushed that to the side, which is a first actually uh, for, like I said, a year and a half. So, uh, yeah, I, it's something I'm working on, to be honest. Not perfect, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. No, no, please do. And if, if I can offer any advice on that front, really, it would be just to, to not worry too much about it. Um, the mm. audience will still be there waiting for you when you come back. And mm. uh, one of the things that we, uh, one of the reasons why Ollie and I started doing this show together. Uh, rather than something individually was so that we had a bit of a fallback so that if like tonight he's poorly it means that i can cover if i'm poorly yeah. because I, I, I do another show on a thursday night with an uh, with a uk based colleague from london bookie youssef and um, when i was I, I was really sort of quite bad with my flu last thursday and um, she did the show by herself because i wasn't up to it myself you know? so I've been sort of built in contingency to try and support with those sort of things. So, uh, but the, the audience will always be there, though, Thomas. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my sort of thing to, to, to sort of bear in mind on that front. Yeah. And, and it, it is easy to put yourself under pressure with these things, though, isn't it? Is. It? I, it is very easy to get yourself to that. Uh, another question for you, Thomas. And uh, excuse me while I cough a second. No worries. Because <laughs> <coughs> I'm still not. <coughs> Absolutely no worries. Take your time. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, how have you ensured finding the balance between sharing the content and, online and maintaining your own creativity in the classroom? Uh, uh, how, how are you finding that balance? The two sort of lie hand in hand. Um, to be honest, Eve, I've always had this daytime work and making sure it's classroom-based stuff, um, focusing on those sorts of things, evenings, focusing on, on videos and coming up with ideas. I'm at a weird crossroads at the same time where they sometimes, I uh, say sometimes, very often cross at the same time. So a new idea that comes out within school or a new idea that comes through Twitter uh, will also be something that I can use on my videos, but then also use in class. And so they sort of cross at the same time. Um, I always prioritize school, making sure the creativity comes through there to start off with. Um, but then I suppose, yeah. I do gain influence from ideas that I, I gain through teaching too. Brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing that, Thomas. Uh, a question for both of you, and I'll, I'll take this one to Sabe first. Uh, what brought you to using social media as an educator? And uh, what was a single piece of advice that resonated with you the most when you first started using social media as an educator? Oh, wow. Um, I actually, I'm new to Twitter. I was, I was a dormant volcano for like maybe six years. Um, and, uh, but I jumped on Instagram early on, um, back in Australia, actually. And it, it, it sort of, to me, it was like 
portable Pinterest, but teaching ideas mm. is, is how I looked at it. Because I wasn't on Pinterest, but I found I was getting a lot of ideas off Twitter. Um, sorry, not Twitter, Instagram. And, you know, it was just easy. It was visual. I could watch a 30-second video. I could see some photos. I could see a blurb. Oh, yeah, easy. I can run with it. Um, and so the, the best advice I got given when I initially joined was actually from a friend of mine, Robin Hall. She was on there. Um, she had as a um, Miss Hall's Happy Classroom. Is um, She's on there as Twitter, um, on Instagram. And she was doing a lot of stuff on literacy. And she just said, you know, people don't want screeds of information. You just want to give them bite-sized stuff that they can try. If it's, you know, if they have to sift through, you know, five or six photos or even three you've lost them just keep it really quick really uh, re really simple that was the best advice that she gave me when i first joined um, instagram that's, that's great advice as well the things that are, you know, sort of hit people really quickly and easily the, the, the nice visuals and things that's one of the things i like about your poster images for example thomas on on uh, on youtube because they really sort of pop when you view them and they, they stand out and you can see those um and exactly what any of the videos are about straight away just from those coverages there and can i ask the same question to you but with a specific focus on youtube how you know, are there some things that you some advice that you'd offer uh people about how to sort of draw in uh, viewers to your channel is there is there, is, is there a process you have in terms of the way you write your descriptions or your tagging or anything like that so you mean if someone were to want to start something along those lines yeah 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 so there's a range of different apps and software. The key things really for YouTube, it's things like click-through ratio, we call it CTR. So that's, like you said, and I, I take that as a massive compliment saying that you think the, the thumbnails, for example, are clickable. That's a huge compliment because it's something that nearly everyone on YouTube focuses on and doesn't really understand. Even the big, big people don't really understand it. Uh, but that's one of the big things. You've got lots of different software that can support you with that. Then titles do matter, making sure that you know they are catchy without being too clickbait, but then also making sure that you niche down very early on. So, Saab, so if I was giving you advice, for example, I might say, yeah, fantastic with Apple, niche down on Apple, specifically education. So all those different tools, keynote uh, pages, because I know that I'm not very strong when it comes to those tools, but I can guarantee at the same time, lots of other people won't be at the same time. So if I was to give advice to you or someone else, it would be niche down early. And that's one of the things that I struggled with initially was not niching down. I sort of wanted to do lots of travel, but then I also wanted to do tech and teaching. But also, the, I think the key message with any form of social media is enjoy it. You have to enjoy it because otherwise it just becomes as, you know, I found out during lockdown a little bit, unless you're enjoying it, you won't want to, to do those things. You know, when I started doing all the Bitmoji things, that was fantastic and I saw lots of growth, but I didn't want to be known as Bitmoji Blakemore, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's just making sure that you pick a niche that you enjoy, and that is, if you look at anyone, if you call them big on YouTube or social media, generally, not always, you'll see that they enjoy what they do. See, so, it's, it's interesting that you say that because at our school, you're known as the Bitmoji dude. And I was, yeah. and, and I kept saying to everyone, I said, no, nah, you just got a whole lot more of, you know, a whole lot more things. I'm a subscriber, by the way. And I do love your, and I do love your cover <laughs> art too, because I've been sort of modeling, I guess, I looked at yours and I was like, oh, that's very easy to see exactly what that video is going to be mm -hmm. about. I don't need to click into that to then, you know, be let down. I know exactly what I'm going to get. So thanks for the work that you'll be doing with that. But um, yeah, so I've been I've been letting everybody know, no, no, he does a whole lot more than just Bitmoji. There's other stuff there. You need to go have a look at it. Um, <laughs> and it, and there's plenty of stuff there. So thank you. Our staff have very much benefited from what you've put out there, mate. Uh, that's awesome to hear. And that's always something that really uh, is it's, it's a weird thing to hear that people watch and see your things, but it's always really appreciated in it. It humbles you, you know, it keeps keeps you going with things. So appreciated. Awesome. It's, it's really motivating, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah, um, absolutely. it sort of spurs you on, I think, as well, to sort of move on to um, sort of do more and share more and all those sort of things. Speaking mm -hmm. of people who share, um, I'd say Mark Ryan, who's been joining us, he's, he's, he's a great sharer and does those things. But someone else um, uh, who's joined this evening is uh, Evo Hernan. Uh, so a big hi to Evo. He um, hey, uh, shares many different ways himself too. So welcome to the show, Evo. Great to have you uh, joining us. Uh, welcome to you uh, this evening. Uh, another question for you both, um, and this time it's around copyright. And you mentioned it a little bit um, in in your segment, Sabe, around uh, using a site such as Pixabay. 
uh, which is a great size for copyright free images. Um, uh, I'll ask you first, though, uh, Thomas. Uh, so, copyright's a huge issue. There's been lots of cases yeah. of people taking resources and ideas and, and these sort of things and then and sort of repurposing them. Uh, I guess video content's a bit more difficult to repurpose and things, but yeah. Um, how, how can you, how do you, you, some of the things, ideas you offer on your or, or use cases in your um, videos uh, do offer up um, sort of creative and, uh, you know, ideas that are from yourself. Um, what, what advice would you give to teachers about sort of protecting their USP, their sort of unique uh, ideas, um, when, when some teachers can sort of take those things and, and then turn them into things that can, that can be monetized? We see this more often with... Um, yeah. uh, uh, sort of paper-based resources, you know, um, uh, retrieval roulette or whatever, you know, and someone coming up with an idea um, and then someone else taking that idea, making, you know, redoing it in, in Word with a different font or whatever, and then popping it on the tears and then selling it for some money when the original person was selling it for free. Have you got any advice around any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, so that's a, this is an interesting one because when I made the, the Bitmoji classroom things, I deliberately chose because of the times that we were in at, the, at that sort of time not to go down the, the paywall and putting anything behind a paywall however there were individuals who saw the content created their own e-courses and made a significant I, I assume amount of money based on the, the amount of individuals that they had I guess I could sit and get very envious of that however I think there's a difference between sharing and stealing uh, I could talk about that one a little bit more. However, I think when somebody sees an idea like mine and sort of adapts it to suit their audience, that's sharing. At the same time, I have had it where I've had to go through, and YouTube's really good for this because they'll, they'll pop up, right, copyright. They've got a, in the YouTube studio, they've got a little copyright section. There have been a few times where someone just downloaded the video, put it on their channel. Mm, it's, not, it's not quite right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so luckily YouTube sorts that one out for you, however, yeah, so that's that's happened at the same time. So I think there's a key difference between sharing and adapting and stealing. And I think there's a few things that you can do to that. I think making sure that within my videos, if I see an idea, and I, I talk about Mr. P's writing for a purpose in some of my videos, um, I'll talk about that one and reference him. So if I'm showing good practice, then I'd hope, and it's not always something that happens, that other people do the same. Now, that's, I've, I've shared an example of when work has just been outright stolen, and <coughs> I just hope that, you know, people start to look at sharing things effectively rather than just stealing, like, that case that I shared. Yeah, wow. it, it is difficult. Um, I, I, I use Creative Commons licensing on everything that I do. Okay. And um, I have a sort of share, share alike approach to that sort of thing. Um, mm. And I have a very specific thing where, and uh, I've, I've got that on my YouTube channel, it's on this YouTube channel as well. It's on um, UK Edge Stories one, it's what I sort of promote through my website. And Creative Commons allows people to take things that you've done, but then adapt them and, and change them, but, but not for profit. And yeah. so it's really, really clear and, and say, you may have seen before um, some of the sort of infographics and things that I share, but I'll always put in the corner a little watermark with the Creative Commons license feature on there. Um, and as I, we mentioned the licensing features inside YouTube before, Thomas, the, 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 there's an option rather than having the standard YouTube license, you can have a Creative Commons license on your YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you go into mm -hmm. the settings, it's, it's, it's sort of double -triple down in there. Sabe, you mentioned um, Pixabay. Have you got any other resources like that where people can go to find um, sort of icons or photos or clip art or yeah. anything that is copyright free? Um, Pixabay Sorry, is copyrighted. Yes, um, um, Pixabay is my number one favorite. Unsplash is another one. Um, Pixabay through the browser actually has access to um, video clips and things that you can use. Um, but through the uh, the iOS app is very limited to just images. But you can get a ton of stuff through. Those are my two favorites. For copyright free soundtracks, um, bensound.com um, uh, is amazing. He's also on Spotify and on um, Apple Music as well. Um, there's um, paid content and there's free content as well, so long as you mention uh, the website that you've got it from. And a lot of my videos have actually got, um, I use his music as um, a, a backing tracks and the kids are onto it as well with you know their projects and things if they haven't had the time to explore GarageBand yet, because I do feel like GarageBand is a bit of a, an, an Everest to climb um, or when you want to come up with something that's, um, you know, that sounds okay. Um, I've directed my kids towards bensound.com to actually try and find something that's, um, you know, workable. Uh, but those are the three that I've often used. Um, yeah. Um, 
uh, it's a hard thing though. You try to get the kids to you know avoid doing a Google search and just stealing some images of Google yeah. images because that's their you know instant go to. Um, yeah. We have to really untrain them out of that. And so you can't use the wall the watermark one. You can't just cover it with your memoji or your bitmoji. That's not okay. <laughs> you know you can't do that. So um, I'm I'm still every year trying to untrain them out of that. That's one for the teachers, I find, in my experience as well. Lots yes. of teachers will, will default to the whole Google Images thing. I yeah. think you've got your fan club in this evening, Sav. We've got uh, Ian Rowe yeah. was uh, sent a message. Uh, great work here. Uh, just giving you a bit of a shout out there. Uh, yes, he's Ian's a PE teacher at our school. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I'd love to have some uh, some friends in. Uh, Louis, uh, Ollie, sorry, Lewis. Uh, Ollie's actually just jumped in. He must be watching from home. Uh, big, I wanted to do a big sort of shout out to you both and sharing your knowledge on uh, World Teacher Day 2020. Thank you both uh, again for taking the time to join us. We're getting close to, to the end of the show now. And, and um, if, when we get to the end of every show, there's always two um, sort of solid questions that we always ask all of our guests. Um, and the first one of which um, is one relating to a non-educational book. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask you this one first, Thomas, if that's okay. Uh, could you recommend a non-educational book uh, that has had a positive impact on you as an educator, please? And I'll be asking you the same question in a moment, Salvini. Absolutely. Uh, so as an educator, I, based on this, this is something that I've read and love. It's essentially Essentialism by Greg McEwen. And it talks about how to cut out noise in a noisy world. And it talks about digital decluttering. And I find it really useful to prioritize things within my life, if that makes sense. So specifically looking at teaching, what to sort of prioritize. And when you have a bunch of requests, there's a specific paragraph about looking at how to say no effectively. And I find it really beneficial to sort of support my own thesis in fact i had a word that i wanted to carry on throughout the year which was going to be essentialism and trying to cut out as much noise rather than being yes man basically being more selective about things that i uh, say yes to so, Brilliant. Uh, great recommendation i'm going to have to make a note of that after the show and uh, give myself a copy of that sounds right up my street thank you for sharing that how about yourself Sabe? I'm going to go a little bit rogue, and I'm going to um, share something that was actually a it was actually a handwritten no a book, uh, I guess a chapter um, by my grandmother. But I want to share the messages in there. Is that is that allowed? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Is that allowed? So um, this is before she passed away. She actually uh, wrote um, like a chapter each for um, for her grandchildren, and in there it had some very wise advice. And she she was an educator as well. And there were three things that she mentioned in in her um, in her thesis to me. And number one was um, about protecting your brand. There's only one version of you out there, and that you know you are your own marketing campaign, and that you need to learn to advocate for yourself because there's no one else in this world that will advocate for yourself. Um, because at the end of the day, it does end up becoming a numbers game because there's so many teachers out there that you can be replaced just like that. Um, and, you know, we'd like to think that we're one of a kind and we are one of a kind, but the reality is that is what happens. And so she spoke about protecting your brand. That was number one. Number two, she um, spoke about um, there's greater strength in silence. Sometimes, um, you know, it's very easy to give vent and go pack a pack a pack and say what you want to say, but you sometimes need to step away, step away from it and look at it from a different angle, whether it's from the child's perspective, the parent's perspective, or from SLT's perspective, and actually kind of work out whether your your viewpoint on that is worth voicing or if it's going to go anywhere but sometimes just you know um uh staying silent is um better than anything else uh and the last um but not least is you talked about when you walk away your walk away image that you leave your stamp that you leave so you know as an educator you carry yourself from life to life um you, you come in um you come into contact with a whole bunch of people whether it's at school whether it's at home and you want to make sure that when you walk away from that the stamp that you leave behind is a oh remember when sabi was here he was so good at x y and z you want people to do that if you um you know uh, and you want 99 percent of the people to do that you know obviously you won't be able to please everybody but you know um you want to aim for that that's that's the pinnacle of what you want to go for um when you carry yourself as an educator as a public figure is more or less what she wrote to me this is all translated from tamil to english but these are the three major things that she highlighted um and i think and we always used to talk to her about how she should write a book, but this is this would have been in a book if she hadn't written it. If she had written it, sorry. 
Oh, bless you, Sammy. I mean, that's, that's not, not only a lovely story in and of itself, but some great advice there too. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that personal um, story. Hey, that's really that's kind great. of you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump on to our last question, if that's okay, and I'll go to you first, Savvy. Um, the first question, uh, sorry, the final question, sorry, um, is uh, what EdTech tool makes your working life easier and why? And, uh, yeah. Uh, it, look, could, for me, it could be an approach. It could be. It could be an approach. It could be a particular tool. It could be. Uh, you heard uh, Neil uh, Statham's one from Immersive Reader from last week, for example. Um, but um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, it's, it's a very tight, close tie for me. My iPad and my Apple Pencil are one, like I guess, hardware tool because it's so portable and I can do anything and everything I want on that. But for me, I think. Um, if someone said to me, you're going to go to a classroom and you have to teach without seesaw, I think I'd probably die a little bit on the inside um, just because I think it's very much ingrained, um, you know, it, with being able to share con share information with the kids, um, you know, give them feedback, get them to actually access it. And I think it's made learning accessible and assessment far more accessible in multiple platforms very easily, regardless of what hardware device you're actually using. Um, so I think to me, it's a, it's a tie between the two. All right, brilliant stuff. So Seesaw and then your iPad and your Apple Pencil as well. I mean, yes. yeah. there needs to come a time where they actually come bundled together, I think. You know, I, I think, I reckon. Uh, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what's needed. Sure. And a keyboard as well. One of those nice new floating keyboards would be quite nice, wouldn't it? Oh, mate. Get out of, get out of free jail card if they gave me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about yourself, Thomas? What's your go-to EdTech tool to help your sort of life as a teacher? So, yeah, other than... Google Classroom, which I use every day. I could bundle in all the, the Google extensions that I use on the regular day-to-day -day basis. The actual tool that I, I've been using every single day at the moment is something pretty new, My Viewboard. I'm not sure if you've heard of this one. Uh, it's something that, because we're sharing all of our assignments to our distance learners through Google Slides on Google Classroom, I can download those as a PDF and integrate them into uh, this My View Board, and then I can write on those because it's not something that I struggle to do at the moment with Google Slides. Not only that, I can drag and drop images straight from there. I can drag and drop YouTube videos. Then I haven't got any distance learners personally, but if there are other classes that have distance learners, then they'll be able to jump on and see the screen at the same time. And there's oh, functionality has been, been fantastic. Just for those lessons where, just playing through a slideshow isn't going to work and you're going to need to do some modeling on the screen. It's been an absolute lifesaver, really. That is one of the things for me that's missing with Google Slides, really. The fact, you know, yeah. I, I, I present on my iPad all the time. I present on my Surface all the time. And uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Keynote and, uh, and uh, PowerPoint. But the ability to quickly annotate and just do stuff directly on, slide, uh, uh, on a presentation is something which is, I think, greatly lacking in slides. So uh, I'm really keen to find out more about it. Could you tell us, um, again, what, what it's called and um, spell it for me? Is that OK? Uh, yeah, my, my view board. So M-Y-B-I-E-W-B-O-A-R-D. I do have a video. I've got two videos, actually, on YouTube. Plug. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, that, that's great advice and uh, thank you both very much for sharing uh, those uh, books and, and say the personal story from yourself uh, Savvy as well and, and uh, those uh, those air tech apps as well uh, we're just over time um, so uh, with that in mind uh, we like to try and keep things to an hour uh, so please do stick around uh, both of you for a chat after the show but uh, for now thank you so much to all of our viewers this evening uh, thanks to uh, Neil and Al and um, and Mark and everybody else. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you as well very much to Savvy and to uh, Thomas for joining us. Uh, but for now, uh, this is um, Learn Live UE done for one week. Next week, we've got a teacher researcher show. And we've got a researcher, David Pedder, joining us, talking about how he works with schools, helping them to undertake research within their schools. So I'm really excited for uh, that episode. Uh, but um, keep them peeled. Uh, please do follow me on Twitter, ICT Evangelist, and Ollie O. Lewis underscore coaching for more updates about what we're doing with Learn Live UE. We're going to do a broadcast later this week with our agenda. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm going to shut up and play a little outro video and uh, say a very nice good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.